Thank you, guys. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in prayer in the name of Jesus. And God, as we come to you, we thank you, Lord, for the worship that has occurred, not only in this service, but the other services as well. Thank you, Lord, for the young people and their singing this morning and their ministry to us. And now, God, I pray as we open up God's word, your word, I pray, God, that you would speak to us. I know the busyness of life, sometimes it's difficult to really just concentrate on what you want us to, to know from your word. And God, as I preach this message to myself and kind of heard it over the weekend with Paul Tripp, God, I pray that you would help me deliver that today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we did have a marvelous time with uh, Paul Tripp this past week. How many of you were able to go to that? Raise your hand. Was it good? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think all of us would agree that um, we, uh, it was more of an oh me than an amen, though, wasn't it? As, as God really worked on our hearts. And so one of the things that really uh, shocked me uh, was yesterday morning when he opened up to Matthew chapter 6, I thought, man, that's what I'm preaching on. You know, God, I, you know. So he gave me some really good insights <clears throat> I'd like to share with you today. No, the, the message was, uh, of course, already had to be written and planned because of uh, the PowerPoint and all that kind of stuff, the overhead. And so, uh, um, you know, I, I am going to add a couple of things, though, that he said, if it's all right, because we're going to be talking about treasures today. As we open up to Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 19, I want to give you a couple of scenarios. Here's a guy that's leaving his office for the last time. He's been laid off. Uh, maybe he's been fired, or maybe he just retired. But he's leaving with his briefcase and the box of his valuables uh, in his side, and he's thinking to himself, wow, 25 years, and I'm gone. And this is, my, this is who I was. He doesn't realize that he's revolved his life so much around his job. That's just who he is. I mean, the old saying is, a man is what a man does. And so that's, what, that's who he was. Now, now, who is he now? A lady, or even a couple, stands on the porch and watches their son drive off with a U-Haul in back of his car, uh, a little trailer hitch there, back of his car, driving off the last one for the last time. Empty nest. And she thinks, hey, this is who I was. What am I going to do? What am I going to do with my life? Who am I now? Now, there's something that those two scenarios have in common, and that is there's a conflict with what is either leaving the door or leaving the job. There's a problem and a conflict with the treasure of the heart because there's a disappointment over something that was treasured greatly. Why is that important? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. It says, For the, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so whatever the treasure is, whatever that means in your life, and whatever the Bible means by that, is so important because it has to do with your heart. Now, we've been in a series of messages on the relationship principles of Jesus. And if you remember in the first message, we talked about some barriers, seven or eight barriers that keep us from having good relationships with the people around us. And one of those is, is that when we place other people or other things, particularly other people, on the throne of our life, then everything gets off kilter. And now we're going, because whoever you choose to be your Lord, your treasure in life, is going to really dictate the decisions of your life, your, your affections. You're going to trust them to provide whatever you need in your life. Could be a husband and wife, could be with children. Uh, you know, for example, raising children, very dangerous thing to put them as the treasure, biggest treasure of your life. Why? Because now you're looking to them for your need. You need to be loved. You need to be accepted. We all need that. And so since you need to be loved and accepted, you're looking to your children to do that, then what you're going to do is do, do everything you can to please your children and to make them love you. You're not going to be able to discipline them. You're not going to be able to raise them objectively. And so it's going to hurt the relationship. If you're that way with your spouse, you're going to hover over them all the whole time, a boyfriend, girlfriend. Oh, this is, this is my need, my need, my need. And so you and I need to realize that in order to have good relationships, 
We've got to take care of the first commandment so we can take care of the second commandment because without taking care of the first commandment, you can never do the second one. And what are those? Jesus said the whole law can be summed up in two things. Love your neighbor, or rather, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He said that's the first one. The second one is like the first one, to love your neighbor as yourself. The first one comes first. If you don't have the first one, can't have the second one. Can't have the relationships that you want. If you have the second one, that just shows that you've got the first one. And so, a couple of things about relationships, or rather, about treasure. First of all, everybody has it. Everybody has a treasure. Secondly, that treasure is going to determine your heart. And the heart, of course, is something that's within you. It's who you are on the inside. And then thirdly, your heart will determine your behavior. Therefore, if it determines your behavior, it determines what's going to happen the rest of your relationships. So it's imperative that you have Jesus Christ as the treasure of your life, not only for your sake, but also the relationships of those of people around you. So I want us to look at this passage with three points. Number one, the principle of the treasure. Secondly, the power of that treasure. And thirdly, the positioning of the treasure. First of all, let's look at the principle of it. You look and you ask the question is, what is the treasure? Look in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. The treasure here mentioned is something that you place value upon. Now, I'm going to use an illustration that Paul Tripp used um, yesterday, and that is this. This is a, a $20 bill that I ha- hold in my hand. Now, you may ask the question, how much is this piece of paper really worth? And you think, let's see, our government's pre, uh, you know, printing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every day, so they guess, I guess they buy the, the paper in bulk. And so certainly the paper's worth less than a penny. And then you say, well, the ink is bought in bulk as well. It's worth less than a penny. But for argument's sake, we'll say that this piece of paper that I hold in my hand is worth, as far as its real value, a penny. But the U.S. government has placed another kind of value on it. It's decided to place the value of $20 on this bill. Why? Not arbitrary. It's it's our monetary system. And so if I take this uh, down to the local grocery store or you take it to the service station, a gas station, and buy gas with it, it's going to get you $20 worth of gas. Now the point is that someone has assigned the value to this. Now, you and I also assign value to things in our life as well. We've assigned value to God. We've assigned value to our spouse. We've assigned value to our our children. And so everything, we decide. Here's Here's the point. We decide what our treasure is going to be. And as Paul Tripp said, you've heard it said many times, one man's trash is another one's what? Treasure. For example, you go down, and you know, some of you ladies love, I'm always getting accused of sports um, illustrations, so I'm going to give a shopping illustration here, y'all bear with me. Uh, you go down to the outlet mall, and you go to that store, or is it Kate Spade or Katie Spade? Which, which one is it? Katie, okay. Kate, well, you can tell I haven't bought my purse yet. So uh, you go down to the purse store, and you go and buy, or look at those Kate Spades, uh, Kate Spade, uh, pocket, uh, pocketbooks. <laughs> I can't get out of my southern Georgia stuff, you know, after all these years. Your purse, and you think, I'd never pay that much. Was it $200? I don't know. $200 for a purse? I'd never pay that much. And another person says, oh, that's a good deal. You could never buy that in a department store like that. That thing's worth, uh, you know, $300. And so you're into purses. You like purses. Nothing wrong with that at all. You say, oh, this will go with all my outfit. No, no, no purses shaped like this. And, um, you know, I can get so much more wear and tear out of it. And that's probably true. And so you buy it. But another person says, that was the craziest thing I've ever seen. I could buy one for $20, looks just like it. And so you don't buy it. Why? Because there's no value to it. You have not assigned a value. But you take your friend down to the shoe store. Oh, another problem, another deal altogether. You've got a pair right now for every 
day of the month, and your goal is to have one every day of the year. And so you go in and buy those pairs of shoes. And the other lady that bought the, the, the pocketbook was thinking, any shoes will do. I just want something comfortable. You know, it's value. Some of you guys would pay, say, $1,000 for a, a pair, a set of, um, of golf clubs. You know, so a pair of, a set of irons to play golf. I would not do that because my game's just not worth it. You know, <laughs> it's just not. But, but other guys whose games are not, you know, I'm not even trying to buy a game. But we got a guy on staff, <clears throat> Herb Long, <clears throat> that buys, buys all this newest stuff. He's trying to, you know, he admits he's trying to buy a game. And uh, what we do, the rest of the staff, we just go down to his warehouse and buy his leftovers, you know, when he gets finished with them. But I wouldn't do that. But on the other hand, if I want to take my wife or my, one of my, my kids, uh, my children to a, a, a Florida, I'm sorry, Georgia, Florida game uh, this November, okay, no, I work alone, <laughs> you know. So, uh, and uh, okay, I am in Florida, Florida, Georgia game. And you look online, you say, oh man, $100 a ticket. Are you kidding me? One guy says, I would never pay that. In fact, I wouldn't even go if you gave me the tickets. You, you understand the traffic that you're going to be facing? It's not worth it. You don't like football. You just don't like it that much. It's not a big deal for you to go to a game. You'll watch one occasionally on TV, but the guy who really is into football places a value on those tickets and, and you, you pay it. Got a baseball in my office. It's probably worth all of two dollars, three dollars, because it's signed by a retired baseball player that you've never heard of, unless you are a Pittsburgh Pirates fan or something. But on the other hand, I know of a guy that has a, a baseball signed by Babe Ruth. It's authentic. And some of you think, hmm, Babe Ruth. Is that the candy bar? <laughs> you, you have no no sense of baseball. What what? It, how much would you pay for the baseball? I wouldn't buy it at all. But if I bought it, I'd just throw it out there to my kids and say, go play with this. But others that know the value of that, you say, well, how much is that? How much do you think that's worth, that baseball? 10000 How much? It's worth how much you're willing to pay for it. It's the same value. It's a, it's a $3 ball. In fact, it didn't cost that much back then. But it's the value assigned to it. So all of us choose our treasure. And so what is the treasure? It's that which you place value upon. And it's part of who you are. Now, you not only have chosen your treasure, but everybody has one. It's just part of being a human being. In fact, here's the test of intimacy, that whether you have this intimacy with your spouse or with your children. And that is this. What do they value? What is the treasure of their heart? Because unless you know that, you don't know the foundational principle of who they are. How many times do you get surprised, especially with your children? I, don't, I can't believe they chose to do this. I didn't know that. I, they went this direction. I, I never could read that. I, boy, they're doing this now, and I never thought they were interested in that. You never knew the treasure of their heart. Everybody has one. Those treasures can change because we choose them. And it's a mark of intimacy. Well, in the first century, it says here, Jesus brings out about wealth. And he brings us as an example. He says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. You see, back then, as in now, uh, your wealth had to do with more than money. It had to do with what you own. So you owned a piece of clothing that was part of your wealth. Remember when Jesus said something about, you know, somebody asked for your tunic, give away your shirt. Your clothing was part of your wealth. Your crops that insects could destroy were part of your wealth. He says, look, all these things are temporary. Anything that can destroy it, and even if it doesn't destroy your earthly wealth, you can't take it with you. And so he says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. What is treasure in heaven? It's, it's investing in people that are going there primarily those who need to go there that don't know Jesus Christ, investing in the kingdom. But it's also investing in other people as well that are already Christians because they're going there as well. So you're investing something eternally by pouring in something, spending money, spending time, spending your thought life, spending your prayer life on someone else. Now, as we do that, as we pour ourselves into someone else, 
there's a heavenly blessing of something permanent, because everything on earth is temporary. Life is a bunch of gains and losses. You gain every day, you lose something every day. The older you get, the more you lose. The younger you are, the more you gain, probably. General principle. But you get to the end of your life, how much have you stored up in heaven? You say, well, pastor, I would love to have the burden for lost people. I, I interviewed a staff guy one time, a potential staff guy, and I asked him the question. Now, our church, I, I said, our church is an evangelistic church, and he knew that. You can check the website and find that out. We believe in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, so are you evangelistic? Of course, he said, yes, because he wanted to be on staff here. Yes, 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 well, I am, I am. And so we came back full circle around, and I said, well, share with me. I was uneasy about the answer. And I said, share with me an instance where you, where you shared Christ. And he could not, he fumbled around, he couldn't, couldn't remember one. And I said, well, you, I thought you said you were evangelistic. Explain that to me. And he says, well, I want to be. I want to have a burden for lost people. I know I don't, but I figured if I came, came to this church, that it'd rub off on me and I'd become what I want to be. You see, we want, deep down, to invest in something that's going to last. But it's difficult with all the other treasures that come up in our life. What's the problem to our life? The problem is the first commandment is not where it needs to be. Therefore, we struggle with the second commandment of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Do you really love your neighbor? as yourself. Do you really do that? You say, well, you know, it's a struggle. Hey, it's a struggle for me. It's a struggle for everybody. But I've just discovered this. When my love for God is interfered with, and he's not the treasure of my life, I have a very difficult time with the rest of it. And so do you. So I, I still love my kids. Yeah, but that's part of the treasure. You see, that's part of what's part of the treasure of your life instead of the treasure of God. Now, here's what happens. It says, it says in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So here, it's, it's kind of like a, a circular thing that go, goes around our life. Here's what happens. You know, we get saved. Jesus Christ becomes Lord of our life automatically. But then other things get in the way, unconfessed sin, other things. In fact, sometimes it's the blessings of God. That's right. God blesses you with, you with something. You never thought you'd ever have that. And all of a sudden, wow, this is so valuable to me because God blessed me with it as an answer to prayer. And you begin to worship the gift instead of the giver. And so now something else has come into place. So what do you do? You invest in that. Your thought life is about that business that you have. You think about it. You worry about it. You're anxious about it. Or you think to yourself, I've never thought, you know, I was told I couldn't have children. Now I have three. And now you, you value them far more than the average parent and you're just pouring yourself and pouring yourself into them. And what happens is the Bible says, wherever you pour yourself into, your money, your time, your talents, becomes more of a treasure. And so it becomes a circular thing. The more you have something else as your treasure, the further it gets away from Jesus Christ. And what happens in our life, it's just like if you can imagine a wheel, you have a hub in the middle that's attached to the axle of the car. You have spokes coming out from it. And if it's, the hub is right in the middle, that wheel should be balanced. There's other things that come into play, but that's <clears throat> primarily the illustration. That wheel's in balance, the car is going to roll. You're going to have a smooth ride. Everything's where it's supposed to be. But if the hub is off-center, you can have all the spokes, all the power in the car you want. It's going to go thump, 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 even at five miles an hour. And the faster you go, the more rough ride it's going to be. Why? Well, maybe God's blessed us with things. Listen, I've got blessings in my life I never thought I would have. And it's a temptation every day to make that the treasure of my life. Every day. So we look at the treasure. Why is it so important? Well, let's look at it further in verse 24 as we look at the power of that treasure. He says, For no one can serve two masters. For either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve God and wealth. Now, here are the idea of the two masters. It's not two bosses. Some of you right now work two different jobs, and you have two different bosses, and they've worked out your schedule, and everything's fine. No, this is a bond slave. 
This is a Roman time where you owed money to someone, perhaps, and you sold yourself into slavery. And now for five years, you have to serve this master 24-7 in order to pay off the debt. You can't serve this guy half a day and this guy half a day, at least not in the Roman Empire. And the, the hearers of this story and this illustration understood that. And they understood, okay, if I'm a bond slave to one, I've got to choose one or the other, and I've got to be sold out just to one. Just to one. Now look back up in verse 22. It says, the eye of the lamp is the body. So then your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Here we find the Bible is speaking about ambition, selfish ambition that we've talked about before. And he gives this as an example. And so it's not just about money here, and though he's concentrating on that because it's a great illustration. And that great illustration is this. We spend our time making money. We need it to live, and God knows that. So we spend our time making money. We spend our time saving the money. We worry about the money. We worry about the business. We worry about the future. We worry about retirement. And he says money is just a great example. Now, what does money do to us? Well, it blinds us. It really does. It not only blinds us to things like influence, greed, covetousness, but also it blinds us to how we're making decisions in life. Somebody says, well, I'm taking this job. And I ask, well, why are you taking the job? And getting down to it, more money. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's your career. It's a big promotion. Maybe it's ambition. The eye speaks about something that you desire, that you want, that you've got to have in your life. And those things point to darkness. And the darkness just simply means the hub is in the wrong place. Everything's kind of going over and over and over and over again in the wrong way. And so he says, look, he says, money is a master that's not well served. Money will not only take you to greed, lifestyle change, wrong decision. In fact, let me just say this on the side. Money has proven to be um, something in your life that will cause you to really make bad decisions. That's why the Bible says that money is the root of all kinds of evil. Let me tell you why. A person with, say, a Ph.D. in psychology feels like himself, and justly so, an expert in the field of psychology. A person with a theological degree says, well, I'm an expert in theology or the Bible. Another person who is, a, we'll just say a heart surgeon, feels like he's an expert in heart surgery. But a person that has a lot of money feels like they're expert in everything. Money makes you arrogant. It does. That's why so many people make bad decisions. They gain a lot of money, lose a lot of money, gain a lot of money, because they don't listen to other people they just listen to themselves because money does that to you. It gives you false confidence within yourself. And so Jesus is saying to us, look, money reveals the treasure of your life. In fact, let me give you a, a couple of things. Money not only reveals, but also your time that you're spending reveals what your treasure is. And so thirdly today, I just simply want to ask the question of where, what is your treasure today? And then how can you get Christ as treasure of your life? So let's look at the positioning of that. How do you locate it? How do you locate what your treasure is right now? What is your treasure? Do you know what it is? Do you know what the hub of your life is? That decision-making thing, it may not be money, it may be ambition. It may be, you know, I'm seeing something with my eye and I desire it and I want it and I want it and I want it. It may be that you want position. It may be your children. It may be your spouse. It may be any, anything. What, what is it? It may be Christ. What is your treasure? And really, you can ask yourself three or four questions on determining that and how to determine it. Well, number one, what do you spend your money on? You know, what, what do you spend it on? Good question. And it's not just your needs. You say, well, I, I buy food and clothing and and as Paul Tripp said, there's a lot of things we think is a need that are not needs at all. So what do you spend your money on? Secondly, what do you spend your time on? What do you invest your time in? There's a certain amount of time you've got to invest into your family. A certain amount of time you invest into your career, and your job. But when you have downtime, where do you invest that time? Number three, 
Where do you invest your thoughts? Look down here with me in um, verse 25. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried. And in, in one of your versions, and this literally means don't take a thought. What do you think about? When you have daydreaming time in your life, what do you think about? Oh, I just stress out over work all the time. I stress out over the kids all the time. I, I just, I, you know, I, I stress out over my ministry all the time. Pastors can do this. What do you, what do you think about? It may be something really sinful, really bad. But what do you think about? Whatever you spend your time on, your money on, and think about, is a great indicator. But fourthly, let me ask you this question. If you were to lose one thing in your life that would break your heart the most, what would it be? You know, if you could say, well, boy, you know, boy, if I lost my job, it would just be so hard. Let me ask you this. Whatever it is in your life that you think is com competing with God in your life, let me ask you this. If, if the devil could tell you, look, if you would give up your relationship with Jesus Christ, then I won't take away this from you. Would you do that? And I think most of us would say, after thinking about that, no way. No way. I would just have to suffer. I just, I can't give that up. Well, let me ask you this. Do we not give up that in reality many, many, many days of our life? That closeness, that bond with God, that loving relationship with God, on the throne of something else. We do give it up. Just not permanently, but we give it up. And so we ask ourselves the question, what's the treasure? Your spouse could probably tell me. Maybe your kids, your kids could probably tell me. But do you know what it is? Do you know what your treasure is? And then, how do you change that? How do you take that hub away and move Jesus into the center as the treasure of your life? I mean, oh, I, I can just tell you, hey, just go and do it. Just put Jesus first. But that's easier said than done. In fact, that's a, that's a wrestling struggle. Many days of our life, not every day. But you say, yeah, well, if I make a decision today, I'm going to have to make it again 10 days from now. Yeah, yeah, you, you might. Or a month from now. Yes, you might. Probably not tomorrow. Probably not real close, but all the time Satan's coming in and, and smacking us down, isn't he? Getting us all, oh, look at this. Look what God has blessed you with. Look, what, look what's happened now. You know, you're, you've been promoted. You know, I'd put my, my job on second base, third base, whatever, you know. But now you've been promoted. Now you've gotten a raise. And now, ooh, it's become something special again. It's always a struggle. So how do you do it? Real quickly, number three things. One, you love God, love Christ. If you love Christ, then you'll trust Christ. Number three, if you trust Christ, you'll surrender to Christ. Really makes sense, doesn't it? So let's look at these. Number one, you love him. Verse 24 says you choose a master. Um, choose for yourself whom you're going to serve. Do you love him? Do you really love the Lord? Do you love him now more than you've loved him before? Don't you find that to be a struggle sometimes in your life? You know, the book of in the book of Revelation, it says to the church at Ephesus, Jesus came and told the church at Ephesus, the very first one in Revelation 2. He says, church at Ephesus, I love your work. You're doctrinally pure. <clears throat> you've got the, the duty going on. You've got all this going on. Man, this is an on-fire church. But I've got one thing against you. You've left your first love. The blessings of God, perhaps, have become more important in their life than God himself. But you've left it. Now, I know, and you know, that we can only love God if he first loves us. We know that. So how do you love God again? How do you place him supreme in your life? Well, how did you do it to start? You and I did that. We, we met Christ. We started loving Christ. He is first in our life at the very moment of what? Salvation. And that's why you come back to the cross. Humble yourself before the cross. I believe that's why God has called us uh, Cross Life Church. 
Back in 2012, I preached a whole year on the cross-centered life. You come to the cross and you're, oh my goodness, God, look at my sin. Oh my goodness, look at the grace that you've given me. I'm overwhelmed with the grace. And now I can relate to somebody else and give them grace because I feel the grace every day myself as I humble myself before the cross. God, how could you ever just die for me? How could you ever go to the cross and be nailed there for me? God, did you know me? And we're humbled by it, and we can't help but, but love Christ as we're drawn to him, and we ask him once again to give us the love in our heart because we feel his love. And then, of course, what do we do? We spend time with him. Listen, if, if, you're, <clears throat> if your spouse, for example, if, you're, if your husband came uh, to you and you could tell he didn't want to spend any time, he was all playing golf, he was fishing, he was hunting, he was working, you hardly ever saw him. You knew he didn't want to spend time with you, would you interpret that as being loved? When we love Christ, we want to spend time with him. And so when we want to spend time with him, we spend time with him, we love him more. If we quit spending time with him, we love him less. You can't go anywhere without that first. Knowing the love of Christ yourself through salvation, but coming back over and over again, every day to the foot of the cross, humbly just asking God to help you. Well, if we love him, and he, we, we're going to know he loves us. And because of that, we can believe him. We can trust in him. The problem here in verse 25, and I don't have time to read through the whole passage, but he says, don't be worried. Don't be worried about your life, what you shall eat, drink, the provision. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow. God provides for them. Look at the lilies of the field. Uh, they grow and they don't toil and they don't spin. The grass of the field grows. He says, God provides for everything, including us. Here's the problem. Something else is on the throne of our life. Something else is a treasure of our life. Whatever that thing is, we're going to trust that for our provision. Whatever our needs are, we trust that for our provision. In fact, the whole idea of worrying here has to do with anxiety. And anxiety comes when we lack control. Don't you get anxious when you're a passenger in the car and your spouse is driving sometimes and you think, oh, why didn't you make that turn? I'm not going to say anything. We should have made that turn. Boy, this sure is a bumpy ride. Oh, could you back off that car a little bit? Getting a little close. What do you do? You, you, you feel like you want to grip for the steering wheel or something. You want to be in control. The remote control. Have you ever, the, in front of the TV, had somebody keep flipping the channels, you know, about 15 minutes, and you say, just park somewhere. Somewhere. You want control. But because we don't have the control of our life, because the opposite of worry is faith. And when we have worry, we don't believe. And because we don't believe, we are not experiencing the love of Christ in our life. And finally, you surrender to him. Look in verse 33 of this chapter. He says, sums it up by saying, seek first his kingdom. That is his rulership in your life and his righteousness. You'll get his character in your life. And all these other things shall be added unto you. Why can you love, uh, love other people? Because you've got the love of God in you. And he says, look, if you concentrate on putting me as the treasure of your life, I'll place my character in your heart as you seek me and seek who I am. And all these other things, including the relationships, will be added unto you. You'll be able to love other people. And the question is, who's the treasure of your life? One of the great illustrations I've ever heard on this came from a book I read years ago called Halftime by Bob Buford. And Bob Buford uh, was a former CEO of a large cable company. And he was coming to a kind of a halfway point in his life. And he says, now, where do I want my life to go from here? You know, he wanted to be in ministry some, and he, he was kind of uh, going between, you know, making more money and in the business world and, uh, you know, ministry, didn't know where to go. So he hired, hired a guy by the name of Michael Cammy who was, uh, at the time and the book was written, an atheist, who had helped Coca-Cola uh, in their quest to uh, try to beat Pepsi out years and years ago, back in the 80s, when they came, out with a new, they came out with a new Coke. Some of you don't know that, but it tasted different, tasted a little bit more like Pepsi-Cola, and it flopped. And they came back to Michael Cammy and they said, look, you're the one that took us off in this direction. Now, what do you have to say for yourself? He says, look, I drew a box, and I said, put one word in the box, and you put great taste. Now, evidently, that's not really what you need. So what is the one thing that I can bounce off and, and draw up an entire plan for you, a strategic plan? What is the one thing that you feel Coca-Cola is all about? And they, after some deliberation, they decided 
American tradition. So they brought back the old Coke. And the rest is history. So Bob Buford, knowing this, called on Michael Cammy. And Michael Cammy listened to Bob Buford for several hours, a couple of different visits. And he said, okay, here's what I hear coming from you, Bob. I hear two things coming from you. Money and Jesus Christ. Those are the two things that are coming. Finances, wealth, and, and, and business. All those things wrapped up. Money and Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to draw a box. He says, you put one word one phrase in that box. It's either got to be money or Jesus Christ. Do you think they can go together? But he said there's going to be decisions you have to make, places you have to go and to make money versus Jesus Christ and ministry. The two are not going to correlate. They'll always conflict. You put three in the box, three things are going to conflict. You can't go one direction when you have many things in the box. What's it going to be, money or Jesus Christ? Well, being a Christian, he said, I felt like I had no choice. I mean, this guy didn't even believe in God. I said, he said, I said, Jesus Christ. And he said, when I said that, I realized that all my life I had made Jesus Christ a priority, one of my priorities, but not the exclusive priority. He said, when it went in the box, I realized the rest of my life was going to be designed around what Jesus Christ wanted for my life. And he's become very successful at ministry and ministering to people around the world. So I ask you a question today, what's in the box? Because the rest of your future depends on what is in the box. What is the treasure of your life? With heads bowed and eyes closed. This morning, I wanna ask you that question, what's the treasure of your life? And do you want Jesus to be that treasure? Do you want him to be that first place. You, you cannot have solid relationships with others until the first commandment's taken care of. Is Jesus your treasure in your life? If you've never received Jesus into your heart, he's not the treasure. How religious you are, I, I don't know, but he's not the treasure because he tells us in the Bible that if we love him, we're going to come to him. He said, if I be lifted up, all men will be drawn to me. So God's drawing you today. He's pulling you. He's tugging at your heart. Do you want to make Christ your treasure today? You can do so by praying this prayer. If you really mean the heart, the heart has to pray as well as the mind. But if you really mean this prayer, Jesus will come to live inside your heart, show you that he loves you, and then you will love him. Come to the cross today. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins. I open up the door of my heart. I ask you to come in. Be the Savior of my soul, the Lord of my life. I put your name in the box today. You are my treasure. As I am your treasure. Thank you, Jesus. In his name.